um, the gas then comes the far the last bit is the um, mercury and ammonia removal um, here and then the gas and it is all shifted same gas so so pretty much hydrogen rich and then they have the membrane separation and then that hydrogen rich thin gas goes to the gas turbine to the turbine um, the hydrogen turbine if you like so and rest of course the heat recovery steam generator the reason I thought I would bring it up in here is that this is not the membrane separation or the all the work that we have been talking about different types of cleaning etc these are not um, just within the realm of uh, wishful thinking but it's actually a, um, a realistic possibility provided you can you have the willingness and the resources to do it okay um, so this the next uh, bit then uh, we have talked a fair bit in here about uh, the warm gas cleanup of course gasification we have spoken and let me just make a point before we move to the membrane separation um, bit that hydrogen turbines there are now turbines available commercially which can burn up to 95 percent hydrogen easily about say um, early 97 98 even that period it was uh, not that available but now it is available so this is something that I've directly taken from DOE's advanced uh, power generation concept so you, it's readily available for anyone to actually see and there they um, also show a few few curves and all um, on the right hand side there are two two boxes one is the efficiency expressed on a uh, higher heating value basis the other one is the cost of electricity as produced because the unit is in dollar per megawatt hour so what I would like to bring to your attention in here is um, they are showing in here as to how they think the projected efficiency does increase not this fine does increase from baseline to advanced hydrogen turbine to ITM which is the like kind of membrane uh, the warm gas cleanup and then the hydrogen membrane uh, if all of this so this is where the baseline is uh, um, 33 on the higher heating value basis not on a lower heating value basis lower heating value basis it will be a lot higher but higher heating value basis is something that uh, the Americans and us we um, express lower heating value basis gives you a bigger number um, but it's an artificially inflated number But LHV efficiency, you will see it's predominantly in the European literature. They put it in as, uh, for, as a, express it uh, on the basis of LHV, but much better to give it uh, on the HHB in my view. No, lower value because HHB is the um, HA higher heating value which comes in the denominator as the input whereas lower heating value which is a lower value which when goes to the input obviously the overall figure looks much better. 
listen now a much more realistic uh, expression hmm? overall system So different point means if you instead of normal gas turbine if you do shifting and this hydrogen turbine immediately you get a jump then if you can increase the uh, uh, if you can um, separate out the carbon dioxide uh, using membranes and put only hydrogen or predominantly hydrogen then you can get a slightly more but, but this is assuming that the cold gas clean up then if you can achieve and prove warm gas clean up then you get more and then if you are able to use um, what's that called the um, hydrogen membrane correct no i have uh, made one mistake in here the itm is actually for uh, separating out lot of the pollutants but for that requires a very low temperature uh, cooling so that's why you will see one gas cleanup is after that uh, and this is of course hydrogen turbine and this is if you are able to separate out the CO2 then the advanced hydrogen turbine is also able to take the gases containing hydrogen but not everything hydrogen but if you obviously if it is designed in such a way that if it is fed only with predominantly with hydrogen high purity i mean high purity hydrogen after hydrogen membranes uh, separation of the um, co2 then you will get even more jump so you can go from that point to about that point water vapor is again as gas only in a short term so the water vapor, the idea, yes, that's right. So CO2 persists. So the, the water vapor, yes, it does um, uh, interfere with the um, IR radiation. That's that's for sure. But then when it condenses out, <laughs> condenses out, so it's back. So so that effect is nullified. It's just like biomass being considered as renewable. Sure, biomass when you are burning it or gasifying it, you are releasing CO2. But then when it is growing it is capturing the CO2 so that's the idea over what time frame so to um, uh, say more specifically over a very short period of time water vapor is a greenhouse gas but at the end of the day when it goes up as vapor it condenses um, yeah so advanced uh, the name advanced comes from Few, few areas. One is the turbine, it's not the conventional gas turbine, the hydrogen turbine. Then membrane separation of the hydrogen. So what does is, what the membrane separation of the hydrogen does is, it sends back hydrogen rich syngas, it then separates out the CO2 to do everything else. So membrane separation for CO2 is um, touted to be less energy consuming than amine-based CO2 capture. So when Dr. Shukanta Das comes on day after tomorrow, he, I actually don't know. He will be able to tell it better. So he will be able to tell it better, so I have left it onto him. But it's not, um, you are not looking at amine-based separation anymore. As you have said the other day, 
about it uh, about 10 percentage point efficiency drop i mean based on 10 percentage point which is huge which means actually 30 percent if your starting efficiency is 30 percent then 10 percentage drop is about 30 percent which is huge but this one is uh, if membrane separation is realized then uh, it is a lot more efficient so Pre-combustion case, yes. Mm. Post-combustion, but correct. So, in absence of membrane separation, which is facilitated by the pre-combustion, I mean the gasification um, scheme, if this was not available, then the amine would have been the only way to go. So, what? This advanced IGCC concept allowed the DOE to do is to focus on where the development's R&D money they will be investing to decide where they will be investing the R&D money. Okay. Um, so where they will be investing the R&D money, of course, um, the hydrogen turbine which has been now been developed, the. Uh, uh, this ITM membrane, then of course the warm gas cleanup, hydrogen membrane for um, hydrogen CO2 separation. If that is possible, uh, that's become successful, then it will it will be it will be wonderful. In fact, back in the early 60s, early 70s, when uh, early 70s when we were growing up, and then mid 70s when we went to the uni. Um, that that time NOx was a big issue from coal-fired power stations. Now no one talks about NOx being an issue. It's solved. So if there is a will and if there is enough resources provided to the right people, then obviously some of the problems can be uh, reduced, the extent of the problems can be reduced. So that's what it basically shows. And, and correspondingly, the cost of electricity can also drop in, in, the, in the opposing manner. OK. So I, yeah, uh, no. Uh, if you are happy with what is currently, which means you are not, you are not, um, you are sending only the uh, normal gas, uh, then then the, you will be stuck with that efficiency. But the point being made in here is that if you prove these independent sub processes and incorporate them then actually there is a benefit. Electricity. Is it? Okay. Mm. I don't know what is high here. Yeah, this is generation, cost of electricity. So 
who come to the directly extend data and then apply it. I mean, that's a starting point. But you know, that's why whenever a new partner is proposed to be here, what are they doing? They do the cost of the Selectivity means uh, the one that you want most. 
selective. So selectivity and yield are the two terms which are used extensively in reaction engineering. It's almost at the co I would say almost at the core of reaction engineering. These two things, this these two things are different. So for example, CO plus steam giving you CO2 plus hydrogen. You can the yield of um, of the conversion of CO means I put in uh, 100 uh, units of CO and how much I got. So the how much I got un, unused or un, uh, unutilized. So that will determine the conversion of CO. But that's one thing. If my focus is to get uh, more of the one product and the less of the undesired product is the the more I get the desired product um, that means that it will be high selectivity. So you can argue that um, um, if I get more hydrogen then obviously less CO2 or less hydrogen more CO2 etc. But the fact is yes that is right but the fact is that you can operate the unit so that rather than going completely to the thermodynamic limit, you take it only to your um, to operate it in such a way that you want exactly what you need. Then you would say that my objective of having the highest selectivity towards my desired product is satisfied. So that's what um, selectivity is. One thing, selectivity is not everything. Even if it is selectively produced still had to has to permeate through. So that's why the high permeability of the membrane is also very, very important. Um, and in doing so, it's very important that everything is done at a low pressure drop. Otherwise, um, you are looking at uh, membranes are very pressure drop intensive. Um, why you will see later on. Uh, and that they are tolerant to um, tolerant to contaminants such as sulfur and chlorine and are capable of operation at system temperatures up to 250 to 60 degrees Celsius because that's where it is after your metallic filter or the filtration system. Uh, so after that ideally you would not like have any more temperature drop to occur. Uh, if any more temperature drop occurs then the warm gas cleanup the efficiency benefit from the one gas cleanup will not realize that. Okay. So, before we go a little bit into the fundamentals, then let's see what are the typical gases that we talk about when it comes to membrane separation in case of gasification. These are the gases on the left hand side, on the left of first column. Uh, obviously, hydrogen is at the top for obvious reasons, but you see there's everything is there, even argon is there, um, because w whenever you are producing in the air separation plant, the oxygen, the, the air separation plant also does produce argon, argon is present in the air, that's where the argon, is, argon comes from, it doesn't come from any chemical reactions or anything, helium, argon, etc., these are all from the atmosphere, that's why the cost of helium cylinder, argon cylinder are so high uh, because it's tiny amount uh, that is present which is separated in the air separation unit. So important thing is the knowing their molecular weight, their diameter expressed as angstrom their specific gravity, uh, their critical temperature and the critical pressure and critical temperature is something that you know, um, temperature above which it will uh, immediately uh, stay in the vapor phase and there's the critical pressure also and specific volume because all of these factors, all of these variables, all of these, sorry, not variables, the parameters are important as far as um, as far as um, um, uh, the perform their performance 
separation performance in membrane is concerned. So, so if you look at say hydrogen and CO2, they are they have a significant difference in diameter. One is about thirty percent higher, and then the then the um, higher order hydrocarbons are also which are also present in small small quantities. Uh, these are also uh, of um, diameter, particularly uh, looking at uh, uh, methane um, to propane to propylene. Uh, you will see that they are about 3.8 to 3.96 to 4.4 angstrom. So, so the membrane in their membrane separation. The diameter, knowledge of the diameter is very, very important, and particularly if those gases are present. So that's why uh, I have put it in here. So anyway, so this, let me put uh, in here, those who do not know, to some of you, if this may be easily known, how this actually work. So on the left hand side, uh, so the, the inside, you have the membrane, um, the, the membrane separator, and uh, the membrane separator, as we have, um, have mentioned, they can be made up of polymers or metals, um, um, and um, so the left hand side is essentially the entry point. It goes into the inside the shell, and then on the there is a low pressure permeate side. Uh, where the permeate will, what will be, whatever is permeated, that would be, that would come out, and whatever is, is does not come out in here, that come out, that comes out at uh, the as the retentate. So retentate and the permeate are the two important thing. But you also sometimes you also need to provide sweep gases here to uh, remove the permeate. So that, um, so that the membrane can continue to work efficiently. Okay. So that's the common um, uh, mechanism. And then separation essentially then in here, it works through diffusion. Uh, and it is through what we call the Knudsen diffusion in chemical engineering, uh, which means it is happening by at a very small uh, diameter, uh, the the smaller one comes out this way. The larger molecule, in terms of the diameter, comes goes out as the retentate provided. You are removing the um, permeate through a sweep gas of some sort. So essentially, if you are uh, removing, separating, say. Um, separating uh, this one from a mix of that, all the larger ones. So these are all present in, uh, these are all present in coal gasification, right? Or for that matter gasification. This is not present for sure because we do it to convert it to zero. So this this is the smallest. So where it, will it come out? It will come out in the permeate side. But in order for to for it to actually come out, you have to apply the sweep gas. And in order to apply the sweep gas, you will not be applying the nitrogen or anything, because then the, it will be diluting it. So essentially, the separated permeate gas, or the same type of gas from another part is very carefully swept from left to right to remove it. So it's essentially like creating um, the, to some extent, a similarity, creating a condition for the reaction to, for a heterogeneous reaction to go into the forward direction. So it's the sweeping of the surface uh, of the, of the uh, gas from the surface there. Correct.
uh, well, um, no, not efficiency. The gas has to come at a certain pressure, and that's what I was, I'm coming to this. Uh, if if you are not supplying the mixed gas at a certain pressure, then it will not go through. Essentially, you are forcing it through the very fine pores, right? And any uh, that means you are diffusing the lowest diameter gas through the fine pores. So when you select the membrane, you select it accordingly. That but if you select the membrane in such a way that everything everything can come back come in the permeate side, then obviously nothing will happen. So production of the membranes with uniform pores corresponding to the uh, high selectivity gas that you want, that's also is an R&D area. But it is more or less resolved by the membrane uh, suppliers these days. Uh, pressure has to, uh, well, you have to have the pressure gradient. Correct, correct, correct. So what will come out? Pressure difference. Correct. So this you are this with this ones you are looking at about two yeah. So on these units you are looking at about two percent, three percent pressure drop at most. Nothing more than that. Uh, as long as the permeate side is kept operated very well with sweep gas all the time uh, and it is sent, kept uh, sweep, so swept with sweep gas all the time then it's not a problem so that you are not allowing it to allowing anything to build up but you can imagine that the gas has to be non-condensable because if it becomes condensable then the membranes will simply lose their operability or if the pores are of such a size that the coarser ones, some of the coarser ones will also try to come out this way, then also the purpose will be different. Yeah. Very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. Um, so there, then, then, uh, then you will be looking at cryogenic air separation, or if it is a very, very small scale, then uh, you will be looking at chromatographic. Correct. Say chromatographic separation, where different gases come out at different residence times. So nitrogen, for example, is 28, oxygen is um, 32. So they will, if you are chromatographically separating them, that's what happens in gas chromatograph columns. Gas chromatograph columns are um, more different to membranes in some sense, in the sense that it is a, a very fine capillary column, but it's still the nodes and diffusion that takes place. Then um, uh, that's how you do it. So if you pass them, one will come out early and the other one will come out later on. So that's, uh, that's how the gas chromatographs are designed and if I don't know if you have ever looked at the interior of the gas chromatograph, um, the columns through which the gases are separated, um, the columns are about this long. No, gas chromatograph is only this time. The columns are very, very long. So what they do is they coil it and they put it. So uh, have some time uh, to uh, have a look at in the interior of the gas chromatograph. You won't break it, uh, but have a look at it as to why they do it. And then there, there are different types of columns. So, but the principle is still the same. So I, I thought I would also um, bring, it, bring this um, out in here, that how the gas separation happens. Because everything is a viscous flow at the end of the day. The all the gas mix that is going, it's a viscous fluid. So viscous flow does, um, uh, the viscosity does have an effect. But also, any 
fluid which passes through a fine pore, um, its behavior is known to be dominated by what is called Knudsen diffusion. Knudsen was the scientist who, um, uh, who discovered this um, phenomenon. The pores with a diameter that is smaller than the mean free path length of the diffusing gas molecules, uh, that's where the um, that's where the um, Knudsen diffusion will take place. And I also definition is there. The mean free path length is defined as the average distance a gas molecule travels before it will collide with another gas molecule. The, the mean free path length of a gas molecule depends on the nature of the gas, the temperature, the pressure, and it is given by so and so. So I, I have taken it from a particular um, paper, and that paper is also uh, in there in the drop box. I think it will be worth uh, reading. It's uh, in the sense that it gives very uh, a little bit of theory, but um, uh, quite a bit of um, application focused discussion. So what it means in here is that the mean free path of a gas is very well known in literature. So you, li you literally actually know it and from there you can actually calculate it what will be the mean free path if, the, if this is the temperature, this is the pressure, etc. But in all cases, in all cases, the membranes uh, pore size will be smaller than the mean free path. And so it is therefore postulated that the separation of that gas molecule, small gas molecules, whose diameter is uh, so small that its mean free path, uh, a diameter so small that corresponding pore size is much smaller than the mean free path. That's, uh, that's the diffusion mechanism that it takes place. Where it is significant, why do we uh, mention this, is that um, if you know the mean free path, then you also know after what distance they will be, this particular molecule will be colliding with their, another one. Now you can imagine if a pore is uh, uh, if two different mo two molecules of the same two mo uh, molecules of the same gas is, is competing with one another or with each other for the same pore, then I its diffusion through it will be delayed. So, knowing the mean free path for that molecule at that temperature and the pressure is important to design it so that you can. Um, ensure that when number of these molecules are coming, they can all come out as permeate. So is that clear? So what do you guys think? So Nitesh has a question. You are giving an answer. Yeah, I saw you talking. I did see you talking. <laughs> uh, so what will permeate out? Say it's hydrogen, 2.89 my uh, angstrom. So your pore size has to be less than 2.89. <laughs> Uh, slightly larger than that. That's it. Yeah. So the mean free path that dictates the length of the membrane that you will be. So if you know that, look, I am sending 10,000 of these molecules, so they all have to come out. But if you are, if you have provided only one pore for those 10,000 molecules, just imagine. Uh, there will be competition amongst them. They will fight with one another to come out, permeate out. Therefore, you have to provide the sufficient number of pores. That will be dictated by even uh, by the mean free path. If you know the mean free path, then you know how long that has to be. 
and you are not only providing in the axial direction, you are also providing in the radial direction. Right? So the po the point again here is that this all are coming this membrane reactor design, uh, membrane reactor design, and so it's all coming from fundamental principles. And sometimes, sometimes, I haven't even referred to it. This is something that we teach in the action engineering. What is the temperature we said shift reaction is preferred? Low in the forward direction, low or high? Lower side and catalyst. Yes. So if you have the if you have the ability to control the temperature of your membrane reactor, if it is a metallic membrane reactor, metallic membrane separator, then then you can control the temperature or the problem from anywhere to anywhere within that range. So if you are controlling the temperature at the lower end, that's also the temperature zone for shift reaction to occur. Because you have got what? You have got the CO, maybe a little bit of steam there in the gas, I don't know, maybe a little, little bit, tiny bit, and the temperature. So that this can potentially also act as a reactor. And in fact, developing membrane reactor and separator in one go is a highly pursued research area. So technically, um, shift reaction is just one example of reaction I'm giving. But technically, any other reaction membrane separation, uh, uh, reaction and membrane separation simultaneously. Provide, because this is come nicely as a reactor shape, you see. And then, uh, so and it is also a separation, separator. So you can achieve both. And if you can achieve both, then um, that's a cost saving. And it is a highly uh, pursued research area, as I said. Theories are still developing how, um, um, wha how one can be uh, made to dominate over the other. I mean, the reaction rate over the uh, separation rate. Because ideally, you would like to have the reaction rate equal to separation rate, uh, if that's your objective. Um, so how you can actually make it, that's a highly pursued area. Because that's where all the concept of reaction kinetics that we talked about, activation energy, and pre-exponential constant, etc., that goes out of the window. Because, <laughs> because there is nothing needed to activate it. <laughs> I mean, or no need for, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the concept of traditional concept of the exponential uh, uh, number and the activation energy doesn't hold good for membrane-based reaction kinetics. Uh, there is different groups are just competing against one another with uh, facilities. Uh, it's, a, it's a hot growing area. So next year, I'm actually planning to take one student to work in this particular area, because there are a few uh, niche applications that I can think of. All it will need is a fair bit of, um, what's that called? Um, the concept is similar. Uh, ion transfer, mem me so, so membrane-wise, the concept is similar. But in ITM, the, it's the ions which are transferring across. In the normal membrane sep um, uh, separators that we are talking about, it is the molecules that you have. Uh, so charging is not an 
deliberately sought event in here. But if you are talking about ionizing and separating, that's slightly different. So is the, when it said the ITM, that's what it's basically it. Of course, if you can ionize something, then it will be become a lot more active. A molecule is the stablest uh, uh, efficiency will be better in ITM. That's why the research on ITM is also progressing. The conventional reaction kinetics that we talk about in presence of uh, this catalytic element, sodium based catalyst or iron based catalyst, etc., that no longer applies in here. Okay, so the membrane itself can be, a, yes, the membrane metal can be a catalyst. So that's, that's also a part of the area that, uh, but it's uh, the membrane surfaces providing the volume for the gases to react, give you the product, remove the product is completely different mechanism than follows completely different mechanism than what is followed in heterogeneous reaction reactors, normal heterogeneous reactors, fixed bed kind of um, uh, reactors mechanism or the mechanism to prevent in those type of things. So membrane reactors are wonderful things, um, still uh, very much at their infancy, uh, membrane reactor and separators, still very much at their infancy. But I thought at least um, rather than um, rather than not showing it, I will bring it to your attention and then uh, as and when needed, if you get more interest, then you should be able to find out where it is. So I have given one reference. Uh, I've given one reference, I'm sure. Mm. Right. So oxygen separation through no, no, it's a special special type of membranes which can actually ionize the gas, and um, so this is uh, it's good that you have alluded to it. No, uh, the uh, the no, okay. Let me digress one um, step back. The normal air separation takes place at cryogenic temperatures. That's why it is so expensive. But the ITM, um, oxygen transport membranes, based oxygen separation, if that can be made to work, that will be actually working at the normal temperatures. And there is the beauty. That's why it is showing a positive effect on the efficiency. Efficiency rise because you are not cooling the gas, uh, cooling the, uh, or a, a taking the, um, um, take, you are not requiring the energy from your overall cycle to be plowed back into the air separation unit, not, not that much. So it is still a developing area, this um, ITM or the OTM has been, uh, DOE has been funding a fair bit of work for the last at least 20 years that I would say. Uh, there are progresses made, it's not water go uh, uh, money going down the drain, but that's what it is, that it is a different principle of um, oxygen separation or air separation. And now people have been talking about chemical looping based air separation as well. So it remains to be seen what gives you consistent quality of oxygen at a high level 
because for the air separation plant you need high purity uh, gas at a large flow rate so that it can be commercially used. OTM has not still reached to that level yet. So usually this, this sort of technologies from fundamental um, identification to scaling up to commercialization you are easily looking at 40, 50 years. Even if you put enough money the knowledge takes time to develop then scale up gradually you cannot go from this big reactor to this big plant so so i have kept um, this paper over there you should um, take a time hopefully to uh, read it then the question then is i thought also it will be useful to tell you that this is no longer in the membrane separators. It's no longer in the realm of a uh, few university academics. This is actually pursued by the large companies. And you, uh, you can see one, two, three, the number three uh, column, where um, uh, all these companies are large companies. So they are, with government support, they are in-house R&D work they are spending enormous effort so and they would not have done so if they didn't perceive a benefit um, but different companies have different uh, application focus so that's why the second column that's what it shows and of course the last one is easy um, so that's a pretty high level information that is given and then I also thought um, it would be good to let you know, having named the manufacturers or the suppliers, um, what is the roughly the module uh, shape in which they supply this. So, um, so this is um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is for the polymer based uh, membranes, polymeric membranes, not the metallic membranes. Metallic membranes, I don't think I have it here, no. So the polymers have been identified. The polymers, uh, these are all resistant to, significantly resistant to sulfides and chlorides, etc. And uh, what these are made up of, and how do they actually look like. So these are like, some are like oven, oven fibers, one by one. Um, some are like uh, plate and frame, and some are like, uh, you know, spirally wound, the, the last one, the silicone rubber. And this can go to quite high temperatures, 260, 300, 400 degrees. Um, silicone uh, can take, uh, you can use it for sealing your um, ductive, the flanges, if all of a sudden they start leaking uh, rather than taking it out and then re, uh, and repolishing it or uh, remachining it you can use high temperature silicone these are available these days easily works up to 500 degrees uh, the problem then is to take it out remove it so 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 that's that's what i thought i would put that in uh, as far as this particular module is concerned Okay, so any question um, on what we have discussed so far? I have, I don't think I have kept it, but I will keep it today. Um, after correcting that F2 FE. How much temperature can they operate? How much temperature do you think can they operate? So, so this is the target. Okay. So that it is not 
less than not less than the temperature that you will that you are seeing here because you would like to keep less temperature drop as as less temperature drop as a, as is possible These polymers are also quite insulating to some extent uh, but the metallic membranes are also quite good and uh, i read that um, uh, with the more and more and faster development of the 3D printers, you can actually print this once in the lab. So you don't have to buy it, order it from the US anymore or from China anymore. You can literally, you can print those at the lab. The metals, the polymeric ones. Yeah, you can, you can tune your porosity. Easily. You can do it first. These days, uh, the other day, uh, the other day means about six weeks ago, I was attending, invited to attend a symposium by BASF on sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid manufacture is a big thing in Australia. So they assembled everyone and then they wanted someone from academia also to talk about certain things. And um, so nowadays, before the develop, uh, BSF develops catalysts, makes catalysts, tons and tons of catalysts. So, um, but nowadays, you know, these are, whenever they are developed from one catalyst to the another, which is easily, usually 10, 15 years cycle. So they come and present uh, from their Shanghai office directly into the class by video uh, link mode. Uh, so the students are sitting in Monash. Uh, I'm sitting in the class, the Melbourne representative uh, in the class or in the Melbourne office and their R&D office, uh, head office is now in Shanghai. They directly produce. So but they were telling that the, the normal cycle of uh, the catalyst development now has been coming down because it, to test one catalyst over the other, you have to make small amounts of so many and nowadays, you can actually make those 3D printers. So making the small quantities now is quicker. Whereas if you have to make small quantities of the new catalysts with different porosities, etc., the pore size is an important determinant of heterogeneous catalysts. If you have to do it in the large facility, it will take so much time. You have to change this, you have to change that, etc. 3D printer has opened up a whole generation of, uh, it's, it's actually a, a disruptive technology, I would say, 3D printing. You can make so many things at your home, even a designer shoe. Uh, if you don't bother about your, your own labor cost, you can, you can make it and then have this colored layer over that colored layer, etc. I can do it. So, so I think is um, the fuel gas strategies that we wanted to talk to. This is all about it. Um, I would like you to go through it. Uh, as it stays in your memory, right from this slide. Uh, who, hmm? This slide, uh, which gives the very basic understanding of what the pollutants are through to the, uh, the last slide, which is more about the recent developments. But, um, but the references are also there so that you can uh, easily go to the uh, depth of anything if you want to. Okay. Very unlikely.
um, first of all, these are still not developed to scale. Number two is when when you develop a membrane for a particular industry application, that may or may not be exactly what you want for another uh, industry's application. So, for example, the coal industry's application, we talk about okay, chlorides and sulfides. But if you go to the acid industries, say nitric acid production or um, uh, sulfuric acid production or uh, hydrogen hydrochloric acid productions, there you are talking about the um, production or uh, the concentration of those species is much, much higher. So that will be another scale of development, another type of uh, uh, polymers, and then testing of it, development of it, testing of it, scaling it of it, and then longer term test of it. And longer term tests are always, you know, seven, eight thousand hours. Um, so that that itself will uh, take a bit of time. Then the other thing is, uh, even if you develop the membranes, then how you connect the membranes with the flanges and the others at a leak tight manner. That's an issue. Still, someone, the mechanical engineers have to sort it out. Let me give you a classic example. When we talked about supercritical, advanced supercritical, ultra supercritical, etc., what is the highest temperature we said? Huh? Huh? 700. Yeah. 600 is easy. 600 day in day out we can buy. You know. So why only less than 1% of the plants are using 700 degree centigrade tubes or not higher than that at all is because of the cost. Hmm? So where is the cost actually? Because you can make a different type of material or metal right now, no problems. You can buy the materials, uh, science and engineering departments in many, many universities will are, are making metals almost every month, new metals. So if you follow their publications, you will see it's just asymptotic rate is growing. So developing the metals at a small scale, not a problem. Testing it at a small scale, it's not a problem. But then making it at a large scale, at a large size, still an unresolved problem. And even more of an unresolved problem is to develop the welding technology for this ones. Because for welding, what you need? You all are mechanical engineers. Huh? No. Now, generally, generically speaking, for welding one thing with another one, huh? <laughs> yeah. so be specific, be technical, be engineer-like. What is the welding material called? Okay, huh? Yeah. Okay. So you all are uh, reasonably clear in your mind what <laughs> I want to say, <laughs> but uh, sometimes you, in your eagerness you try to talk too early. Uh, so the filler material, right? So when you develop a super duper uh, materials for uh, that, you hopefully can generate steam at 750 degrees centigrade if you can. The development of the corresponding filler material for welding it is another challenge. Someone else has to do it. And so far, that is still an unresolved technique, unresolved problem. You can f use, uh, d make a f uh, develop a filler, and then make a small welded piece. And then you have to test it 
over 8,000 hours, 6,000 hours, 16,000 hours, 32,000 hours. Uh, and that's what takes time. So there is a, um, a test uh, for high temperature um, steel development program um, by, that, has been, that has been pursued by the Europeans and then the Americans um, and it has stopped now. It used to be called COMTES, C-O-M-T-E-S. I did talk about it a bit. Majority of the cost for that program and the length, uh, the time for the program was actually longer term testing. Because just imagine if a filler has been developed and a welded piece has been made and that fails after 6,000 hours, then you will have to do it again. And then check it for again in, ex in excess of 6,000 hours. So throwing a lot of money is not going to help. And unfortunately countries, they don't collaborate with one another. That this country is given the opportunity to um, uh, do focus on this type of material, this country with that type of material, then it would be a little bit more, a uh, little bit less time consuming. So now uh, the Europeans and the Americans, they have stopped their program because they are moving away from coal. So the, the Chinese have taken it up. Uh, what they um, do is not published. And about five or six years ago, the Ministry of Energy here our Ministry of Power, one of those two in here. I know that they uh, talked about putting funds into uh, this type of programs, high temperature materials development for uh, steam power plant application. I don't think, I haven't heard anything since in the last four or five years. So it's a, because it's simply because it takes so much effort. And only few uh, groups can do it. Hardcore mechanical engineers couple do it, material scientists. So, so that's the that's the thing. So your question, that do I see this becoming wholesale replacing um, uh, a separation plant, or wholesale replacing the other modes of gas separation? This one, hopefully. So, but then, you know, it's a question of putting the right resource at the right point with the, with the right people. Otherwise, things will not move. Okay. So please uh, go through this. I will, uh, this particular file, I don't think I have kept this one, but I will keep it tonight. It's this. Okay. Any question? So let's stop at this point. Immediately after the break, the two gentlemen who will be presenting, we'll, have, we'll hear from them. And then I will continue with the other bit that I wanted to uh, finalize today.